Lord Jesus Christ, come among us and be our companion in life, that we may not be the instrument of our own or of any other person's oppression. Amen. From the reading of Amos appointed for today. I hate, I despise your festivals and I take no delight in your solemn assembly, says the Lord. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Throughout elementary and high school, I was taught lies. I was taught that the Declaration of Independence stated that all people are created equal, but that that did not apply to me and people who looked like me. I was taught that black and brown people are inherently inferior to white people, in particular, intellectually, culturally, and morally. I was taught that people with physical and mental difficulties should be locked away. I was taught that lesbians, gays, bisexual, transgenders were morally depraved and they were not to be treated with dignity. I clearly remember the day in eighth grade when my teacher and vice principal, Mrs. Dahlgren, declared to us in history class that Europeans had the right to come and conquer this continent because Native Americans were doing nothing with it. When I asked, wasn't it wrong to steal from people? I was punished immediately. I was taught that America was built for and by white people and white people only should be the leaders of government, industry and society. I was taught that America was only at its best when white people were in charge, particularly white men with an occasional nod to white women. I was taught that God favored and smiled only on white, straight, able-bodied people. I was taught all this in the Chicago public schools that I attended, which were overwhelmingly white. I was told that I had to be deferential to white teachers and students who were white, even if they were younger than me, no matter what they said, no matter what they did to me. The American dream I learned was for upstanding, God-fearing white people and the nightmare of bigotry was the lot for the rest of us. Lately, those attitudes and words have echoed in my heart and mind, not from just the past of my youth, but I hear them, I see them uttered loudly in the past four years, and especially in this run up to the election. I hear them from the vocal portion of our country, though it may be the minority, but a vocal portion saying that that's what they mean by we want our country back. And so I woke up on Tuesday, election day, despondent and afraid. Not about any particular candidate or party winning or losing, but despondent by what we have lost as a people in this country and what we have taken on, which is the demonizing of one another. This election demonstrates clearly for all to see the anger, resentment, selfishness, violence, intimidation, bigotry, and delusion that is operating in our society. A willingness to undermine our democratic principles in order to be winners. We see that by the naked and racially oriented voter suppression. Power may make right only if one has on the lens of bigotry. 
despondent, I felt that some, maybe many white people think that if people of color were to gain power or the majority of the population, whites will be treated the way people of color have been treated or that by people of color gaining some place in our society means that white people lose a zero sum game. Despondent, I texted my longtime friend and close friend, the presiding bishop, Michael Curry. I told him of my disillusionment at this mo moment in history as we were about to vote. It was early in the morning and I told him I was afraid that as a person of color, there was much to be afraid for and of. And what I was afraid of for other people of color was also what I was afraid for those who are mentally or physically challenged. What I was aware that might happen and my fear for immigrants and refugees given the climate of our culture. Fear for LBGTQ rights, especially marriage, possibly being overturned by the Supreme Court. And I tell them of my fear of denial, the denial of all of that going on and the denial of global warming of God's creation. And that quickly we will go well beyond the tipping point if we don't take care of this environment, this fragile earth. Our presiding bishop listened. He well understood my fear and anxiety for he too is a person of color. But then he reminded me of the other part of the life that I have lived, the other part of my story in this country, the other part of our history in this country. He reminded me that this country has been at this point before, even though we did not live through it, it has happened before. But eventually the goodwill, the compassion and the generosity that is inherited in us Americans, finally has prevailed time and time again. Michael Curry and I both remember, we saw the nightmare on television of Bull Connor and fire hoses, attack dogs, all against peaceful protesters that were beaten by police. We remembered those scenes, but he also reminded me that we stand on the shoulders of those people who went through all of that for our rights our leaders and our heroes throughout the history of this country. We talked about the courageous and articulate Barbara Jordan and how we miss her today, of Shirley Chisholm. But it also brought to mind other witnesses of justice among Americans who are of Asian extraction, Yurt Kochimayama, Patsy Mink, and Helen Zia. Among our indigenous brothers and sisters, Sarah Deer, a Muskegee Creek, Nathan Phillips and Sierra Fields a Cherokee. We remember the Latinos and Latinas who have strived for justice. Cesar Chavez, Lucy Acosta, Evelina Lopez Antoinette and Juan Figueroa. And then Michael spoke about the author James Weldon Johnson. And he said, we must keep chiseled in our hearts and minds, the words in what we now call the black national anthem, lift every voice and sing. He reminded me of some of the words. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark, pa dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. And onward, he wrote, thou who hast by thy might, let us into the light. Keep us forever in the path, we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, 
May we forever stand true to our God, true to our native land. It was then that I realized that my foreboding and despondency came from straying away from the places where we have met God in the journey for justice and instead relying on the political realities of today. That I was drunk as it were with the wine of power politics played out on every channel that you can turn to on television. And drunk with all of that information, I forgot that God is present even in this mess. Indeed, in my own mind, I was like one of those foolish bridemaids that we heard in today's gospel. I was without the oil of the witness and heroes of the past. I was without oil for faith and trust in God momentarily. God reigns, my brothers and sisters, God reigns no matter what happens. If Trump if Trump is or was reelected at this point, we do not know as I record this on Thursday. If he is reelected, God still reigns. If Biden is elected, God still reigns. Neither Trump nor Biden are the Messiah and neither political party is anointed by God, but we, Christians are called to proclaim the anointed love of God for all people that we have found in Jesus. And by his life, we know that we are called to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Yesterday on a Zoom gathering of bishops and canons of the Episcopal Church, Michael Curry went further to say, the social fabric and construct of America is at stake, but it is also clear, just as clear as God came into the world as Jesus to reconcile us to God, we are to be reconciled with God and with each other. Reconciliation, Michael said, is what God is up to in the world. And that is our work, to be repairers with God of the breach. He said, justice is next, but it is not enough. The goal is redemption, but the goal is also reconciliation, and the goal is also justice. As Amos and the prophets declared, we must be about justice for all. Michael said, it's not complex, but it is tough. And finally, Michael Curry said in our meeting, he, he said what we heard Abraham Lincoln say at a state convention back in the 1850s, where he restated uh, what was in the gospel of Matthew chapter 12. He put in these words, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And Michael said, it is time. It is time for us to bind up this nation's wounds and to make e plurimus unum real. So my brothers and sisters, that is the task before us. It's always been before us, but especially now that we must listen to each other with respect and compassion, noting others' experiences are different from ours. That we must build bridges over the ravines of divisiveness. We need to bind up the brokenness in this country and to use both love and the resources available around us to do love. In particular, I call your attention to go to the Braver Angels website, and there is a session called Hold America Together with ideas and practices for us to start binding up this nation. 
for the past two months as I've been driving back and forth, I pass a street, I pass a home on the main street of my town. And there's the sign out front that I really didn't pay a lot of attention to, but I did after talking to Michael. It says, please make America smart again. Make America smart again. And to that, I'd like to add, make America stand together again. We can do this if we put God first in our hearts and minds. Because if God is first and is always in our hearts and minds, in our words as we speak, in the things that we do, if God is first, then we will do the work of the gospel of love. We will bind up the brokenness. We will be working with God who is about reconciliation always. Let us pray for this nation as found in the Book of Common Prayer. Help us, O oh Lord, to finish the good work here begun. Strengthen our efforts to blot out ignorance and prejudice, to abolish poverty and violence. And hasten the day, O oh Lord, when all people with many voices may unite in one chorus that glorifies your holy name. Amen. <laughs>